is almost the conventional wisdom of modern man that science is the engine for a better life. Smartphones, automobiles, cameras. It seems that the progress of humanity will never stop, and all we have to do is to learn more about how stuff works. Get the know-hows of natural surroundings of which we ceaselessly seek scientific explanations. Even the problems of technology can be solved by more technology. Unlike other disciplines such as arts and humanities, science is what we can turn to for stability as reliable source of knowledge. We call it objective. Science is objective. I believe this is a statement that most of us are not unfamiliar with since young, as others try to explain to us why is science important and different from other disciplines. But how much truth does this seemingly intuitive statement actually hold? Well, according to American science philosopher Helen Longino, science may not be that different, but bears similarities to other disciplines such as art criticism and philosophy. She writes, the respect in which science is objective is one that it shares with other modes of inquiry, disciplines such as literary or art criticism and philosophy. Bizarre, right? Well, I'll explain in this video just that, about how Longino got to this comparison. But before we jump into the grounds on which Longino does that, let's first frame the argument a little bit more. In chapter 4 of her book, Science as Social Knowledge, Longino digs into the idea of scientific objectivity, as to the scientific realist view that scientific theories are referential about real things. Objectivity of science is more about an objective mode of inquiry. This means that instead of worrying about the real existence of things, those who see science as an objective mode of inquiry believe it is the unique methodology of science that makes it objective and gives it its authority. Particularly, the scientific assessment of a hypothesis through reasoning and rigorous logic. This is a popular view called logical positivism. While values and subjectivity play a role in scientific inquiry, they are only limited to the initial stages of the research. For example, in the discovery of a theory or hypothesis, they do not shake the fundamental structure of logic of scientific research which they believe fundamentally protects us from our biases and assumptions as the guardian of scientific objectivity. An alternate view is skeptical of this infallibility, hyperconscious of the human-driven environment and the context of assumptions that scientists operate and practice their research. They believe that the objectivity of individual practitioners should be separate from that of science itself. They believe that the positivist view is too simplistic and the idea that science can be perfectly done if all the ingredients are right is simply wrong. Despite their distrust in a single formula, contextualists are able to maintain the objectivity of scientific methods or knowledge due to a conceptual shift to refocus on the social nature of science. That is, to see science not as a result to be done, but rather as a practice three aspects to understanding science as a practice. First, scientists depend on one another for intellectual and material resources to practice science. Second, the initiation of scientific inquiry requires education, which means a scientist inherits, expands on, or subverts the ideas or traditions that come before them. They do not or cannot embark on an inquiry simply in a vacuum without any kind of training or influence from others. Lastly, the continuation of scientific research and the possibility of becoming a scientist depends very much on the society keep to value them. Just like other institutions such as schools and hospitals, if we, the public of the society, do not value them, we would not willingly divest part of our money to fund their research or support it as a viable career path. So how do these relate to arts and philosophy? Well, if science is a social practice, its value then consists in its participation from those in the scientific community. Instead of idolizing one theory developed by one team 
or contributions of individuals, scientific objectivity can only be achieved through the back and forth clashing and mashing of ideas. It is on this ground of its social character, which Longino terms the publicity of science, that Longino redefines scientific objectivity and draws similarities between science and arts and philosophy. It may be easy to see that in philosophy, that as a discipline, it is heavily influenced by practices and traditions of the ancient Greeks, such as Socrates' constant quest for dialogue and conversations with strangers, and his student Plato's legacy of the academy, which is the foundation of higher education institutions up to today. This exchange is also apparent in art criticism. Although the scope of it is subject to debate, taking its broad definition as activities engaged in the evaluation of art objects, say that most of us have been a critic at one time or another and are constantly in debate with each other. If about a music or film review, we would not expect the author to offer the ultimate interpretation that settles the case once and for all, regardless of their status either as chief of some powerful mainstream media or a highly accomplished and influential scholar. Regardless of their individual appeal, we seem to intuitively know that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and there is always more to interpretation and advancing our knowledge of the artwork. It is an activity that can only be perfected through practice and continuous engagement. Another similarity is the logical publicity in all these disciplines. I use this in two parts, as both the shared language within the discipline through which members can use to describe their common experiences and understand each other, and the shared understanding that certain things exist independent of individual perception. This is most obvious in science because don't we love observable facts? But this is also present in other disciplines. For example, when we analyze a film, we talk about its narrative and formal elements, such as the story structure, the character arc, cinematography, mise-en-scene, the wardrobe, etc. Although our judgments may vary vastly, at least we share the understanding that the film itself exists independent of our individual interpretations. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Of course there are certain things about science that other disciplines don't have, and it would be utterly wrong of me to ignore them. For example, science depends largely on empirical data, which are observable and quantifiable data as evidence, as compared to inquiry in other disciplines which may use evidence that have more layers of human intervention and interpretation. Let's turn to Van Gogh. In the painting The Starry Night, the dark bluish tone may mean to me melancholy and isolation, but it may mean to you rebellious and hallucinatory ecstasy, while the colors and shades are physical observable qualities in our evaluation. They are not quantifiable and are dependent upon our emotional interpretation. The spectrum of evidence is even broader in the context of philosophy, which draws on experiences of all sorts as evidence to make its argument, ranging from arithmetic logic all the way to our most intimate feelings. We may also have higher expectations from science because of the practical benefits it has yielded, proving itself as something that actually works. However, it is crucial to see beyond the instrumental value and inquire if what we have believed is truly what we have believed it to be.